enjoyed getting to talk with you here on location with RoboCop in Dallas, beautiful downtown Dallas. Um, let's uh, let's just get right into it. First of all, we hear the shots in the background. Guns uh, going off. What what is the storyline of RoboCop? The plot is about it's it's set nebulously in the future, and it's about a good Joe, an average guy, a good policeman who is taken by the powers that be in corporate America put in a lethal situation where he almost loses his life. He's taken away. He's transformed into a cyborg, a cyberneticized human being, a walking computer, a, a killing machine. And um, partway through the movie, through a series of events, he discovers that there's a something inside of him, a soul, if you will, a humanity that he doesn't realize is a robot is there, but he has glimmers of it and then he become he begins on this search to find out who he was and it's an action adventure yarn and it's a thrilling tale of vengeance and um, good guys and bad guys but at the core of it is the the beautiful part of it which is why I did it and I think why Paul Verhoeven is doing it too it's a story not unlike Beauty and the Beast it's about a wonderful person trapped in uh, the body of or the accoutrements of a beast. And it's about humanity trying to struggle through. It's about the goodness of uh, people trying to transcend um, the evils of the computer, if you will. That's what it's about to me, anyway. And it's a gas. It's a little bit like w The Wizard of Oz, too, you know? It's like, if I only had a heart. When this role was offered to you, did you just right away say, oh, I yeah? did. I did right away. Now, when I heard the title, I went RoboCop. Well, and then Paul Verhoeven's name was connected to it. And uh, truth be told, about a year and a half ago, I wrote down on a list of objectives to do in the future five directors that I really wanted to work with. And he was number three. Uh, I was truly uh, just taken and stunned by his work. And so when I heard his name connected with it, I said, you know, shouldn't be fooled here by this title, although the title sounds action like and so forth there's something else to this because if Paul Verhoeven is doing it you can bet there's some story about humanity in it and sure enough I read it and there was and I walked right in and told him look I love your work and I want to do this thing and so after some politics here we are uh, so uh, you you offered your services before they came to you I just went in and put my cards right on the table I said I didn't lay back and say you know maybe or maybe not you know De Laurentiis is calling, or, you know, whatever the hoopla, you know, that we all do as film actors and film stars do. But no, I just went right in and said, look, here's what I want to do. I want to do this movie, and I want to do it with you. He was a little sort of stunned by that, you know, but push came to shove, and here we are doing this film. And now that you're working with him, is it what you thought it would be? It's uh, way beyond what I thought it would be. It's completely different than what I thought it would be. Paul Verhoeven is, uh, he is a driven and compelling uh, megalomaniac, if you will, and I enjoy every minute being with him. He is the most, yet, most on the set, inventive and um, experimental and exciting guy I've ever made a movie with date and he's very demanding and I'm in this suit which you can't see uh, due to the politics of Orion Studios but it's a beautiful suit and you will see it and it's an incredible th piece of uh, art if you will to make work but we make it work and it's gorgeous and it was uh, designed by Rob Bottin who's a, one of the finer special effects makeup artists in the world and so Paul's demands on me and demands on the film you know were at first like wait a minute, you know, let's take a break, you know, let's discuss this, but he wanted to go into fifth gear right away, and bless his heart, I just went into fifth gear with him. I said, I love this guy, so I'm going to trust anything he tells me to do, and I love it. I love being a putty in his hands, so to speak. We, of course, will not have film clips on uh, what the RoboCop looks like until the movie comes out in July, but I'll say this part of it. Can you give me any sort of description of the suit and what it was like for you as an actor? Yeah, well, I prepared for it for five months. The suit, the body cast, 
I started with those five months prior to the beginning of the film. I had to go to um, Los Angeles with Rob and be have every piece of my body perfectly molded and sit like in tubs of of whatever they make those broken arm casts, plaster, without moving, you know, for 40 minutes, just a hand, and then another 40 minutes, just an arm, and then one with the entire body, and then a knee and a foot, and so when this suit came out, what it is, it's a rubber undersuit of ribbing and very futuristic looking, almost black skin, and then it's this oversuit that looks like titanium, really. It looks like this very modern space-like metal. It's green and blue, and it's sort of it's it's opalesque, and uh, it has it has great sort of muscular structure to it, and yet it's mammoth. The head is very sleek. It's a little bit pointed in the front. It has a two-inch black visor. I mean, like a strip of sunglass through it. It comes down to under my nose. It has black under the chin. It's like I'm completely entombed in it, but. The musculature of it is is uh, very Greco-Roman. It's very sleek, and the movement in it is very controlled and robotic and accentuated. And it also can be fast. But and I have a gun that's bigger than a house. It takes four or five guys now. It's a gun that's it's like I don't know where they got this gun, but I'm told there's only three of them in the world in civilian use, so we had to go through the Department of Firearms, Federal Department of Firearms, to get permission to use this thing. It's a pistol that fires automatically. It comes magically out of my leg. The leg, my leg just opens up and this gun comes out. It breathes fire like a dragon. And, uh, you know, it's, it's fun being Robo. Robo is uh, magical. This whole thing has been very unique and magical to me. It's been the most demanding, arduous and yet satisfying and thrilling thing I've ever been involved with. As far as comfort when you're in the suit, is it heavy? Is it hot? Is it scratchy? What is it like? All of those. <laughs> all of the it's all of those very things. It's heavy and it's hot and it's scratchy. Uh, if, if it was a day like it was 106 degrees, like it was this August and we were shooting outside, I end up in the day with maybe two and a half pounds of water weight that I've sweat off into the rubber suit just rubber from head to toe and it's pliable but it's rubber nonetheless uh, it's heavy it's about 40 pounds 40 pounds doesn't sound like much but if you carry 40 pounds around all day and you are falling downstairs or having 45 people with Uzi machine guns shoot at you about this far away throwing yourself over walls it gets pretty heavy and it's extraordinarily hot however I've almost become sort of like a recidivist with the suit. It's like a guy, I hate to make the analogy, but it's almost like a guy who goes, keeps, can't wait to go back to prison because he can't make it on the outside. Well, I've become so accustomed to the suit, like it's, I don't know who I am, you know, without this suit. Somebody says, you want to go to dinner? And my social life is sort of really nebulous. It's nil in Dallas because I'm out of the suit for a second or for two hours and I, and I want to carry these things around, you know? It's like I have this skin that I've lost and disturbs me. And I become very happy in this suit. And, and uh, everyone makes a, you know, cuts a very wide path for me. And I don't talk to anyone as robo. I just sort of sit and think my robo thoughts. Does he talk or just make noises? Robo talks. Wonderful. Great, great guy. Well, uh, Ryan's very high on this thing now. Very. Yeah. Yeah, they really dig it. I think it will. From your mouth to God's ears, Howard. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, there was something I was just going to say about. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, let's see, where were we now? I wanted to add something here about uh, Paul and myself. You know, as we were working with this, and Jost Vacano, who's a, one of the world's greatest cinematographers who did Das Boot, all those running shots. and you know, we have this suit that's a million dollars or something, and we have this idea, my characterization that I've worked five months on, that they're sort of, they're not clear about. And then they have their vision of the film, and Yost has his vision of all these amazing shots. Well, at the beginning of this film, you see, uh, due to some technical 
difficulties and some mis not mistakes, but some miscalculations in planning. We didn't get the suit at the right time to prepare the filming to start the rehearsal, and all everybody was all the departments were prepared. We hadn't all worked together at the same time, so here was this you know conglomeration of five entities that didn't really know each other, and it was an experiment. I mean, nobody's made a film like this. Nobody's gotten inside a million dollar suit that you know walked around like this, except my forerunner, as they say, my granddad. Gort, who was a character in The Day the Earth Stood Still, a wonderful film by Robert Wise. Uh, but that was just, you know, a robot that came out and stood. But to play a man, a, the human... See, let me back up and tell you this. It's not like bionic man. It's not about, like, a computer inside of a guy who looks human. It's about a human trapped inside a computer. A functioning, walking, talking computer who's been lobotomized, amputized, and now it's just a machine, and then discovers a human being from within. You see the difference there. But the excitement was that Paul and Yost and myself and the various departments, we had to make this thing work and go where no man has feared to tread. I mean, there was no path here to follow. And that's what's been the thrill of it. We had to make and invent a lot of it up as we went along. And Paul is brilliant at inventing. And I can't, couldn't think of a better guy to be with. Now, Peter, today we're on location with you. And uh, you were scheduled for a shoot sometime this afternoon, weren't you? Yeah. And, uh, and yet, I guess things are running long or whatever. The story this, of the movies. This ha exactly. And I've been on lots of locations. and. Uh, this is just the way it is. There's always a lot of time uh, while you're waiting to go on. Now, for you as an actor, when you know, okay, I'm supposed to go shoot at 4 o'clock, but it's now 5.30, 6 o'clock, and you still haven't shot, what, what does that do for you as, as, as an actor? Because you're stage trained, right. and, and it's even more of an adjustment for you. What I do is I play the trumpet. Lo and behold, I go back to the instrument that took me to North Texas State in the first place, which was trumpet and why I play jazz. I go into Winnebago, I put in some tapes, and I play the trumpet. And I play and play and play. Or I pick up a guitar and play that. And that or, I, or I write poetry. And uh, those are the three things that get me by. The, I believe that it's very important what a film actor does when he has time. Some guys can just go do it. They say, You're, we're ready for you, and you go get into your thing. I, I can't do that. I need a time to prepare. I need time to put my head into this. If somebody comes and tells me you're going to have a two-hour break, that's fine. I'll play the trumpet for a while, and then i got to put some time away to get my head back into this film. It's so it's hard. So I, I, I'm not too, although I, I try to be, and I like to be, because I love crew people, and I love crew of a movie set, I can't be too uh, sociable, you know, I can't sit around and jaw and jaw and jaw because my head gets farther and farther away from the movie, and then when I say it's time to go, you know, I've been talking about football for the past two hours, and I don't feel any more like doing this movie than the man in the moon, you know, I feel like I just woke up again, you know, to, to go to work, and I go, oh, gee, however, if I sit in the Winnebago and play the trumpet, you know, my thoughts are my own, you know, my feelings are my own, and somebody says we're ready to go, I'm, uh, I'm ready to go. Yeah. I wish we, I wish we had heard you playing the trumpet. We could have taken some pictures of you playing the trumpet. Well, yeah, I guess. Can we do that? Um, or is it too late? To, are you out of the trumpet playing now? I think I'm out of the trumpet yeah, playing now. Okay. I played almost a day. <laughs> I was thinking where the trumpet is, but I don't think it's anybody nearby. So. Oh, okay. All right. Well, Peter, it's wonderful to see you again. Let me tell you something. How wonderful you look, and well, it's not just you. television. I think you're ageless. I'm, staring, I'm sitting here staring across from you. <laughs> and I remember when I went to North Texas and I watched your show, and I said you look exactly the same. You look fantastic. And you had your eyes tested. Lately. <laughs> <laughs> but I accept the compliment. Please thank do. You. Thank you. I mean you, it from it's the bottom of my heart. You. you bet. Thank you, Bobby. <laughs> okay. Uh, it might be. Sure. I'll call, I'll definitely come through and we'll do it again.
Really? Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. I think you, you know what, I, I, I want to jump ahead and say that I bet you really like this film. I bet you really like it. Well, I, I always tried to make but now I can see, and I know Rob's I remember Don't shoot. This is a special effects guy. What film was it? Since he was 14 or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, you know all this about him. Oh yeah, I know. He'd be really flattered if he did. I bet you it was that film um, with Ann Turkell. About the, about the fish people coming out of the sea. And, <laughs> what's the name of that movie that Rob did, his first big flick with Ann Turkell about the fish people? Humanoids. Human, humanoids of the Deep. No, I don't think that was the The Howling, maybe. The Howling. Yeah. Oh, was the Howling? The Howling, yeah. Yeah. That was really good, The Howling, yeah. Peter, what is the storyline of Robocop? about three guys in the back of it. <laughs> it's about a... It's a it's That's about good. Okay. Mommy, that's definitely him. Okay. Peter, what is the storyline of RoboCop? Well, it's about a policeman that the old Detroit in set in the future. That's right. What is the storyline of RoboCop? It's about a man uh, who's a very good cop and comes to a... Peter, was this a role that you wanted very much to do? Yes, when I read it, I said immediately it's something I want to do. Okay. Peter, is this a role you wanted very much to do? Yes, it's um, something I read and wanted to do right away. Are you saying then that you sort of offered your services? I did. I said right up front, yes, I want to do this. What do you mean? Why did you want to work with this director? I think uh, his films are gifted and the humor. Okay, okay. Why did you want to work with this director? I'd seen all of his films and I thought they were very good and powerful. Okay. Now that you're working with him, is it anything like you thought it would be? It's much more outrageous than I ever dreamed. Um, what is this suit like that you're wearing? Very sleek, physically, yet inside it's heavy and a bit cumbersome. What all did you have to go through when they were making the suit? I had to sit uh, for eight hours a day for about six days while they made plastic casts and everything. What is it like to wear this suit? Is it hot? Is it scratchy? Is it uncomfortable? It's all of those things. It wasn't. That's not what I said. It's hot and scratchy and heavy. Heavy. Okay. Let me do that again. Okay. What is it like when you're wearing this suit? Is it hot? Is it heavy? Is it scratchy? It's all of those things and many more. How much does the suit weigh? Um, as an actor in the suit, what what sort of feelings do you have? Uh, initially, I was claustrophobic, but now I'm used to it. I love it. I look forward to it. Okay. All right. We'll just do some reactions now. Okay. I'm okay. So you can talk anything. Okay. I was going to say, is this woman runs up to me and says, uh, "Oh, thank you, officer. Thank you." I sort of stand right now. I don't know. 
How to do it, Daryl? Okay. okay thanks. Oh, there's. Wait a minute. Um, it's afternoon, and now here it is. The day is almost gone. You still haven't shot. So, what is it you do as an actor when you're just waiting around for hours? I play the trumpet. And the guitar. And I sit and read. Give me a favor. Ask that one again. Okay. Peter, what do you do when you're on call, you're waiting for hours, and you're still not working? What do you do to pass the time? I play the trumpet, and I play the guitar, and I write poetry, and I'm actually keep busy on the phone. I might not have my new apartment to start renovation. <laughs> okay, Daryl, that'll do it. Todd? 